party of 30 sat down to table, the general alone was served like a prince, while everyone else was dying of hunger, a circumstance which in those days of equality strangely shocked the new guest. The next morning, at break of day, the general took him out in his cabriolet to admire, as he said, the preparations for attack. As soon as he had crossed the height and come within sight of the roads, they got out of the carriage and entered some vineyards by the roadside. The commandant of artillery then perceived some pieces of ordnance and some digging, for which it was literally impossible for him in the slightest degree to account. Dupa said the general haughtily, turning to his aide-de-camp, his confidential man. Are those our batteries? Yes, general. And our park? There, close at hand. And our red-hot cannonballs? In yonder houses, where two companies have been employed all morning in heating them. But how shall we be able to carry these red-hot cannonballs? These... This consideration seemed to puzzle them both com completely, and they turned to the officer of artillery and begged to know whether, through his scientific knowledge, he could not explain how the thing was to be managed. Napoleon, who would have been very much tempted to take the whole for a hoax, had his interrogators evinced less simplicity, for they were more than a league and a half from the object of attack, summoned to his aid all the gravity he was master of and endeavored to persuade them before they traveled themselves about red-hot cannonballs to try the range of the shot with cold ones. After a great deal of trouble, he at length prevailed on them to follow his advice, but not till he had very luckily made use of the technical turn Coupe de proof, proof shot, which took their fancy and brought them over to his opinions. They then made the experiment, but the shot did not reach to a third of the distance required. And the general and Dupas began to abuse the Marseillais and the aristocrats who had, they said, maliciously spoiled the powder. In the meantime, the representative of the people came up on horseback. This was Gasparin, an intelligent man who had served in the army. Napoleon, perceiving how things were going on and boldly deciding on the course he meant to pursue, immediately assumed great confidence of manner and urged the representative to entrust him with the whole direction of the affair. He exposed without hesitation the unparalleled ignorance of all who were about him and from that moment took upon himself the entire direction of the siege. Cartau was a man of such limited intellect that it was impossible to make him understand that to fa facilitate the taking of Toulon, it would be necessary to make the attack at the outlet of the road when the commandant of artillery sometimes pointed to this outlet on the map and told him there was too long. Cartau expected he knew very little of geography, and when, in spite of his opposition, the authority of the representative decided on the adoption of this distant point of attack, the general was haunted by the idea of treasonable designs, and he would often remark, with great uneasiness that Toulon did not lie in that direction. Cartel wanted one day to oblige the commandant to erect a battery with the rear of the gun so close against the front of a house as to leave no room for the recoil. On another occasion on his return from the morning parade, he sent for the commandant to tell him that he had just discovered a position from whence a battery of from six to twelve pieces would infallibly carry to load in a few days. It was a little hillock, which would come out three or four forts and several points of the town. He was enraged at the refusal of the commandant of artillery, who observed to him that although the battery commanded every point, it was itself commanded by every point that the 12 guns would have 150 to oppose them, and that simple subtraction would suffice to show him his disadvantage. The commandant of the engineer department was called on for his opinion, and as he concurred without hesitation in that of the command of artillery, Cartel said that it was impossible to do anything with those learned corps 
as they all went hand in hand at length to put a stop to difficulties which were continually recurring. The representative decided that Cartel should communicate to the commandant of artillery his general plan of attack and that the latter should execute the details according to the rules of his department. The following was Cartel's memorable plan. The general of artillery shall batter too long during three days at the expiration of which time I will attack it with three columns and carry it. At Paris, however, the engineer committee found this summary measure much more humorous and wise, and it was one of the causes which led to Cartel's recall. There was indeed no want of plans for the retaking of Toulon, having been proposed as a subject for competition in the popular societies. Plans poured in from all quarters. Napoleon says he must have received at least 600 during the siege. It was to the representative Gasparin that Napoleon was indebted for the triumph of his plan, that which took too long. Over the objections of the committees of the convention, he preserved the grateful recollection of this circumstance. It was Gasparin, he used to say, who had first opened his career in all the disputes between Cartel and the commandant of artillery, which usually took place in the presence of the general's wife. The latter uniformly took the part of the officer of artillery, saying with great naivete to her husband, Let the young man alone. He knows more about it than you do, for he never asks your advice. Besides, it is you who are to give the account. The glory will be yours. This woman was not without some share of good sense. On her return to Paris, after the recall of her husband, the Jacobins of Marseille, gave a splendid fete in honor of the disgraced family in the course of the evening. The conversation happened to fall on the commandant of artillery, who was enthusiastically praised. Do not reckon on him, said she. That young man has too much understanding to remain long a sans-culotte. On which the general exclaimed with the voice of a stentor, Wife, Cartel, would you make us all out fools then? No, I do not say that, my dear, but I must tell you, he is not of your sort. One day at headquarters, a superb carriage arrived from the Paris road. It was followed by a second and a third and at length. No less than 15 appeared. It may be imagined how great was the astonishment and curiosity occasioned by such a circumstance in those times of Republican simplicity. The Grand Monarch himself could not have traveled with greater pomp. The whole cavalcade had been procured by a requisition in the capital. Several of the carriages had belonged to the court. About sixty soldiers of fine appearance alighted from them and inquired for the general in chief. They marched up to him with the important air of ambassadors. Citizen general, said the orator of the party, we come from Paris. The patriots are indignant at your inactivity and delay. The soil of the republic has long been violated. She is enraged to think that the insult still remains unavenged. She asks, why is Toulon not yet retaken? Why is the English fleet not yet destroyed? In her indignation, she has appealed to her brave sons. We have obeyed her summons and burned with impatience to fulfill her expectation. We are volunteer gunners from Paris. Furnish us with arms. Tomorrow we will march upon the enemy. The general, disconcerted at this address, turned to the commandant of artillery, who promised in a whisper to rid him of these heroes next morning. They were well received, and at daybreak, the commandant of artillery led them to the seashore and put some guns at their disposal, astonished to find themselves exposed from head to foot. They asked whether there was no shelter or appallment. They were told that all those things were out of fashion, that patriotism had abolished them. Meanwhile, an English frigate fired a broadside and put all the braggadocios to flight. There was but one cry throughout the camp. Some openly fled, and the rest quietly mingled with the besiegers. Disordered anarchy now prevailed. Dupas, the factotum of the general-in-chief, a man of no ability, made himself busy and was continually meddling with the artillerymen and the arrangement of their field trip and batteries a plan was formed to get rid of them they turned him into ridicule and urged each other on till they became very vehement in their jokes on a sudden dupas appeared among them with all his usual confidence giving orders and making inquiries about everything he saw he got uncivil answers and high words arose the tumult spread on every side cries of 
L'Aristocrat and La Lanterne were echoed from every mouth, and Dupont clapped both spurs to his horse and never returned to annoy them. The commandant of artillery was to be seen everywhere. His activity and knowledge gave him a decided influence over the rest of the army. Whenever the enemy attempted to make a sortie or compel the besiegers to have recourse to rapid and unexpected movements, the heads of the columns and detachments were always sure to exclaim, run to the commandant of artillery and ask him what we are to do he understands the localities better than anyone this advice was uniformly adopted without a murmur he did not spare himself he had several horses killed under him and received from an englishman a bayonet wound in his left thigh which for a short time threatened to require amputation being one day in a battery where one of the gunners was killed he seized the rammer and with his own hands loaded 10 or 12 times a few days after he was attacked with a violent, cutaneous disease. No one could conceive where he had caught it until Mirone, his adjutant, discovered that the dead gunner had been infected with it in the ardor of youth and the activity of service the commandant of artillery was satisfied with slight remedies and the disorder disappeared. But the poison had only entered the deeper into his system. It long affected his health and well nigh cost him his life. From this disorder proceeded the thinness, the feebleness of body, the sickly complexion, which characterized the general-in-chief of the army of Italy and the army of Egypt. It was not till a much later period at the Tuileries that Corvus Sar succeeded by the application of numerous blisters on his chest in restoring him to perfect health, and it was then that he acquired the corpulency for which he has since been remarked from being the commandant of artillery in the army of Toulon. Napoleon might have become general-in-chief before the close of the siege, the very day of the attack on the little Gibraltar, General Dugomier, who had delayed it for some days, wished to delay it longer. About three or four o'clock in the afternoon, the representatives sent for Napoleon. They were dissatisfied with Dugomier particularly on account of his delay. They wished to deprive him of the command and to transfer it to the chief of the artillery, who declined accepting it. Napoleon went to the general, whom he esteemed and loved, informed him of what had occurred, and persuaded him to decide on the attack. About eight or nine in the evening, when all the preparations were completed, and just as the attack was about to commence, a change took place in the state of affairs, and the representatives countermanded the attack. To Gomier, however, still influenced by the commandant of artillery, persisted. Had he failed, he must have forfeited his head. Such was the course of affairs and the justice of the times. The notes which the committee of Paris found in the office of the artillery department respecting Napoleon first called their attention to his conduct at the siege of Toulon. They saw that in spite of his youth and the inferiority of his rank, as soon as he appeared there, he was master. This was a natural effect of the ascendancy of knowledge, activity, and energy over the ignorance and confusion of the moment. He was, in fact, the conqueror of Toulon, and yet he is scarcely named in the official dispatches. He was in possession of the town before the army had scarcely dreamed of it. After taking little Gibraltar, which he always looked upon as the key of the whole enterprise, he said to old Gomier, who was worn out with fatigue, Go and rest yourself. We have taken too long. You may sleep there the day after tomorrow. When de Gomier found the thing actually accomplished, when he reflected that the young commandant of artillery had always foretold exactly what would happen, he became all enthusiasm and admiration. He was never tired of praising him. It is perfectly true. As some of the publications of the period relate that de Gomier informed the Committee of Paris that he had with him a young man who merited particular notice for that whichever side he might adopt, he was certainly destined to throw great weight into the balance. When de Gomier joined the army of the Eastern Pyrenees, he wished to take with him the young commandant of artillery. But this he was unable to do. He, however, spoke of him incessantly, and at a subsequent period, when this same same army was on the conclusion of peace with Spain, sent to reinforce the army of Italy, of which Napoleon soon after became general-in-chief. He found on his arrival that in consequence of all Dugomier had said 
of him, the officers had, to use his own expression, scarcely eyes enough to look at him. With regard to Napoleon, his success at Toulon did not much astonish him. He enjoyed it, he says, with a lively satisfaction, unmingled with surprise. He was equally happy in the following year at Giorgio, where his operations were admirable. He accomplished in a few days what had been attempted in vain for two years. Vendemir and even Montenotta said the emperor never induced me to look upon myself as a man of a superior class. It was not till after Lodi that I was struck with the possibility of my becoming a decisive actor on the scene of political events. It was then that the first spark of my ambition was kindled. He, however, mentioned that subsequently to Vendemire, during his command of the army of the interior, he drew up the plan of the campaign, which was to terminate by a treaty of peace on the summit of the Smyrna, which plan he shortly afterwards carried into execution at Leuven. It is perhaps still to be found in the official art archives. The well-known fury of the times was still farther increased under the walls of Toulon by the assembling of 200 deputies from the neighboring popular associations who had proceeded thither for the purpose of instigating the most atrocious measures. To them must be attributed the excesses which were then committed and of which the whole army complained. When Napoleon afterwards rose to distinction, attempts were made to throw the odium of these atrocities on him. It would be a degradation, said the emperor, to think of replying to such calumnies. As soon as Napoleon took the command of the artillery at Toulon, he availed himself of the necessity of circumstances to procure the return of many of his old companions who had at first left the service on account of their birth or political principles. He obtained the appointment of Colonel Gassendi to the command of the Arsenal of Marseille. The obstinacy and severity of this man are well known they frequently placed him in danger it more than once required all napoleon's vigilance to care to save him from the effects of the irritation which his conduct excited the ascendancy which napoleon had acquired through his services in the port and arsenal too long afforded him the means of saving several unfortunate members of the emigrant family chabrian or chabrian who had been overtaken by storms at sea and driven on the French shore. They were about to be put to death, for the law was decisive against emigrants who might return to France. They urged in their defense that their return had been purely the effect of accident and was contrary to their own wishes. The only favor they solicited was to be permitted to depart, but all was in vain. They would have perished had not the commandant of the artillery hazarded his own safety and procured for them a covered boat, which he sent off from the French coast under the pretense of business relative to his department. During the reign of Napoleon, these individuals took an opportunity of expressing their gratitude to him and informing him that they had carefully preserved the order which saved their lives. Napoleon was himself at various times exposed to the fury of revolutionary assassins. Whenever he established a new battery, the numerous patriotic deputations who were at the camp solicited the honor of having it named after him. Napoleon named one of the battery of the patriots of the South. This was a sufficient ground for his being denounced and accused of federalism, and he had been... And had he been a less useful person, he would have been put under arrest. Or, in other words, he would have been sacrificed. In short, language is inadequate to describe the frenzy and horror of the times. For instance, the emperor told us that while engaged in fortifying the coast at Marseille, he was witness to the horrible condemnation of the merchant Hoogs. A man of 84 years of age, deaf and nearly blind, in spite of his age and infirmities, his atrocious executioners pronounced him guilty of conspiracy. His real crime was his being worth 18 millions. This he was himself aware of, and he offered to surrender his wealth to the tribunal, provided he might be allowed to retain 500,000 francs, which he said he should not live long to enjoy. But this proposition was rejected, and his head was cut off. At this sight, said Napoleon, I thought the world was at an end, an expression which he was accustomed to employ on any extraordinary occasion. Barra and Freron were the authors of these atrocities. The emperor did Robespierre the justice to say that he had seen long letters written by him to his brother Robespierre the Younger, 
who was then a representative with the Army of the South, in which he warmly opposed and disclaimed these excesses, declaring that they would disgrace and ruin the revolution. Subversion. Napoleon, when at Toulon, formed friendships with many individuals who subsequently became very celebrated. He distinguished in the train a young officer whose talents he had at first much difficulty in cultivating, but from whom he afterwards derived the greatest services. This was de Rock, who, with a very unprepossessing person, was endowed with talent of the most solid and useful kind. He loved the emperor for himself, was devoted to his interests, and at the same time knew how to tell him the truth at proper seasons. He was afterwards created Duke de Friol and Grand Marshal of the palace. He placed the imperial household on an excellent footing and preserved the most perfect order. At his death, the emperor thought he had sustained an irreparable loss, and many other persons were of the same opinion. The emperor told me that de Rock was the only man who had possessed his intimacy and entire confidence. During the erection of one of the first batteries, which Napoleon, on his arrival at Toulon, directed against the English, he asked whether there was a sergeant or corporal present who could write. A man advanced from the ranks and wrote by his dictation on the appallment. The note was scarcely ended when a cannonball, which had been fired in the direction of the battery, fell near the spot and the paper was immediately covered by the loose earth thrown up by the ball. Well, said the writer, I shall have no need of sand. This remark, together with the coolness with which it was made, fixed the attention of Napoleon and made the fortune of the sergeant. This man was Junot, afterwards Duke of Abrantes, Colonel General of the Hussars, Commandant in Portugal, and Governor General in Illyria, where he evinced signs of mental alienation, which increased on his return to France, where he wounded himself in a horrible way. He died the victim of the intemperance, which destroyed both his health and and his reason, Napoleon, on being created general of the artillery and commandant of that department and the army of Italy, carried thither all the superiority and influence which he had acquired before Toulon. Still, however, he experienced reverses and even dangers. He was put under arrest for a short time at Nice by the representative Laporte because he refused to crouch to his authority. Another representative pronounced sentence of outlawry upon him because he would not suffer him to employ all his artillery horses for the posting service. Finally, a decree which was never executed summoned him to the bar of the convention for having proposed certain military measures relative to the fortifications at Marseille. When attached to the army of Nice or Italy, he became a great favorite with the representative Robespierre the Younger whom he described as possessing qualities very different from his other brother, the latter Napoleon never saw. Robespierre the Younger, on being recalled to Paris by his brother some time before the ninth of Thermidor, exerted every endeavor to prevail on Napoleon to accompany him. If I had not firmly resisted, observed the emperor, who knows whether this first step might have led me, and for what a different destiny I might have been reserved. At the army of Nice, there was another representative, an insignificant man. His wife, who was an extremely pretty and fascinating woman, shared and even usurped his authority. She was native of Versailles. Both husband and wife paid great attention to the general of artillery. They became extremely fond of him and treated him in the handsomest manner. This was a great advantage to the young general, for at that time, during the absence or the inefficiency of the laws, a representative of the people was a man of immense power. The individual here alluded to was one of those who, in the convention, most contributed to bring Napoleon into notice at the crisis of Vendemiaire. This was a natural consequence of the deep impressions produced by the character and capacity of the young general. The emperor relates that after he had ascended the throne, he again saw his old acquaintance, the fair representative of Nice. She was so much altered as to be scarcely recognizable. Her husband was dead, and she's reduced to extreme indigence. The emperor readily granted everything she solicited. He realized, he said, all her dreams, and even went beyond them. 
Although she lived at Versailles, many years had elapsed before she succeeded in gaining access to him. Letters, petitions, solicitations of every description had proved unavailing. So difficult it is, said the emperor, to reach the sovereign, even when he does not wish to deny himself. At length, one day when he was on a hunting excursion at Versailles, Napoleon happened to mention this lady to Bertier, who was also a native of that place and had known her in her youth. And he, who had never yet deigned to mention her and still less to regard her petitions on the following day, presented her to the sovereign. But why did you not get introduced to me through our mutual acquaintances in the army of Nice, inquired the emperor. Many of them are now great men and are on a constant footing of intimacy with me. Alas, sire, replied she, our acquaintance ceased when they became great, and I was overtaken by misfortune. The emperor one day communicated to me some details respecting this old friendship. I was, said he, very young when I first knew this lady. I was proud of the favorable impression I had made on her and seized every opportunity of showing her all the attention in my power. I will mention one circumstance to show how authority is sometimes abused and on what men's fate may depend, for I am no worse than the rest. I was walking one day with the representative's wife, inspecting our positions in the vicinity of the cold tendy. And I suddenly took it into my head to give her an idea of an engagement and for this purpose ordered the attack of an advanced post. We were conquerors, it is true, but the affair could be attended by no advantage. The attack was a mere whim, and yet it cost the lives of several men. I have never failed to reproach myself whenever I look back on this affair. The events of Thermidor having produced a change in the committees of the convention... Aubrey, formerly a captain of artillery, was appointed to direct the committee of war. And he remodeled the army. He did not forget himself. He promoted himself to the rank of general of artillery and favored several of his old comrades to the injury of the inferior officers whom he dismissed. Napoleon, who was at this time scarcely 25 years of age, became a general of infantry. And he was chosen for the service of La Vaughan. Day. This circumstance induced him to quit the army of Italy in order to protest earnestly against the change, which on every account was unsatisfactory to him, finding Aubrey inflexible and even offended at his just representations. He gave in his resignation. The narrative of the campaigns of Italy show that only a short time elapsed before he was again employed in the topographical committee by which the moments of the movements of the army and the plans of the campaign were arranged. He was thus engaged at the period of the 13th of Vendemiaire. Napoleon's expostulation with Aubrey on the subject of his new appointment formed a perfect scene. He insisted vehemently because he had facts to bear him out. Aubrey was obstinate and bitter. Because he had power in his hands, he told Napoleon that he was too young and that he must let older men go before him. Napoleon replied that a soldier soon grew old on the field of battle and that he had just come from it. Aubrey had never been in any engagement. They came to very high words. I informed the emperor that on returning from my emigration, I occupied for a considerable time... In the Rue saint Florentin, the identical department in which this scene took place, I had frequently heard it spoken of, and though it was described by unfriendly tongues, each nevertheless took great interest in relating the details and in trying to guess the part of the room in which any particular gesture was made or any remarkable word spoken. The history of the famous day of Vendemiaire, which had so important influence on the fate of the revolution and of Napoleon, will show that he hesitated for some time before he undertook the defense of the convention. On the night succeeding that day, Napoleon presented himself to the Committee of Forty, which was established at the Tuileries. He wanted to procure mortars and ammunition from Meudon. But such was the circumspection of the president, Campaceres, that in spite of the dangers which had marked the day, he refused to sign the order and merely by way of accommodating the matter requested that the guns and ammunition might be placed at the disposal of the general. During his command of Paris, subsequently to the 13th of Vendemiaire, Napoleon had to encounter a great scarcity, which occasioned several 
popular commotions. One day, when the usual distribution had not taken place, crowds of people collected round the baker's shops. Napoleon was parading about the city with a party of his staff to preserve public tranquility. A crowd of persons, chiefly women, assembled round him, loudly calling for bread. The crowd augmented, the outcries increased, and the situation of Napoleon and his officers became critical. A woman of monstrous size and corpulence was particularly conspicuous in her gestures and exclamations. Those fine, epauletted fellows, said she, pointing to the officers, laugh at our distress. So long as they can eat and grow fat, they care not if the poor people die of hunger. Napoleon turned to her and said, good woman, Look at me, which is fatter, you or I? Napoleon was at that time extremely thin. I was a mere slip of parchment, said he. A general burst of laughter disarmed the fury of the populace, and the staff officers continued their round. The memoirs of the campaign of Italy show how Napoleon became acquainted with Madame de Beauharnais, and how he contracted the marriage, which has been so greatly misrepresented in the accounts of the time. As soon as he got introduced to Madame de Beauharnais, he spent almost every evening at her house, which was frequented by the most agreeable company in Paris. When the majority of the party retired, there usually remained Monsieur de Montesquieu, the father of the Grand Chamberlain, the Duke de Nivernay, so celebrated for the graces of his wit, and a few others. They used to look round and see what the doors were all shut, and they would then say, let us sit down and chat about the old court. Let us make a tour to Versailles. The poverty of the treasury and the scarcity of specie were so great during the Republic that on the departure of General Bonaparte for the Army of Italy, all his efforts joined to those of the Directory could only succeed in raising 2,000 louis, which he carried with him in his carriage. With this sum, he set out to conquer Italy and then marched toward the empire of the world. The following is a curious fact. An order of the day was published, signed Vertier, directing the general-in-chief on his arrival at the headquarters it needs to distribute to the different generals to enable them to enter on the campaign the sum of four Louise and Specie. For a considerable time, no such thing as Specie had been seen. This order of the day displays the circumstances of the times more truly and faithfully than whole volumes written on this subject. As soon as Napoleon joined the army, he proved himself to be a man born for command. From that moment, he filled the theaters of the world. He occupied all Europe. He was a meteor blazing in the firmament. He concentrated all attention, riveted all thoughts, and formed the subject of all conversations. From that time, every gazette, every publication, every monument became the record of his deeds. His name was inscribed in every page and every line and echoed from every mouth. On his appearance in the command. A total revolution was observed in his manners, conduct, and language. De Cray has often told me that he was at Toulon when he first heard of Napoleon's appointment to the command of the Army of Italy. He had known him well in Paris and thought himself in terms of perfect familiarity with him. Thus said he, when we learned that the new general was about to pass through the city, I immediately proposed to all my comrades to introduce to them, to him, priding myself on my intimacy. I hastened to him full of eagerness and joy. The door of the apartment was thrown open, and I was on the point of rushing towards him with my wanted familiarity, but his attitude, his look, the tone of his voice suddenly deterred me. There was nothing offensive either in his appearance or manner, but the impression he produced is sufficient to prevent me from ever again attempting to encroach upon the distance that separated us. Napoleon's generalship was moreover characterized by the skill, energy, and purity of his military administration, his constant hatred of peculation of any kind, and his total disregard of his own private interests. When I return from the campaign of Italy, said he, I had not 300,000 francs in my possession. I might easily have brought back 10 or 12 millions. That sum might have been mine. I never made out any accounts, nor was I ever asked for any. I expected on my return to receive some great national reward. It was publicly reported that Chambord was to be given to me, and I should have been very glad to have it. But the idea was set aside by the directory. I had, however, transmitted to France at least 50 million for the service of the state. This, I imagine, was the first instant in modern history of an army contributing to maintain the country to which it belonged instead of being a burden on it. 
when Napoleon was in treaty with the Duke of Modena, Salicetti, the government commissary with the army who had hitherto been on indifferent terms with him, entered his cabinet. The commander Dest said he, the Duke's brother, is here with four millions in gold contained in four chests. He comes in the name of his brother to beg you to accept them. And I advise you to do so. I am a countryman of yours. I know your family affair is a directory, and the legislative body will never acknowledge your services. This money belongs to you. Take it without scruple, without publicity. A proportionate diminution will be made in the Duke's contribution, and he will be very glad to have gained a protector. I thank you, coolly answered Napoleon. I shall not for that sum place myself in the power of the Duke de Modena. I wish to continue free. The commissary in chief of the same army used often to relate that he had witnessed an offer of seven millions in gold made in a like manner to Napoleon by the government of Venice to save it from destruction, which offer was refused. The emperor smiled at the transports of admiration evinced by this financier to whom the refusal of his general appeared superhuman, an action much more difficult and noble than the gaining of victories. The emperor dwelt with a certain degree of complacency on these anecdotes of his disinterestedness. He, however, observed that he had been in the wrong and that such a course of conduct was the most improvident he could have pursued, whether his intention had been to make himself the head of a party and to acquire influence or to remain in the station of a private individual, for on his return he found himself almost destitute, and he might have continued in a career of absolute poverty while his inferior generals and commissaries were amassing large fortunes. But, added he, if my commissary had seen me accept the bribe, who can tell to what lengths he might have gone? My refusal was at least to check upon him. When I was placed at the head of affairs as consul, it was only by setting an example of disinterestedness and employing the utmost vigilance that I could succeed in changing the conduct of the administration and putting a stop to the dreadful spectacle of directorial peculations. It cost me an immense deal of trouble to overcome the inclinations of the first persons in the state whose conduct under me at length became strict and irreproachable. I was obliged to keep them constantly in fear. How often did I not repeat in my counsels that if my own brother were found to be in fault, I should not hesitate to dismiss him. No man in the world ever had more wealth at his disposal and appropriated less to himself. Napoleon, according to his own account, possessed as much as 400 millions of specie in the cellar of the Tuileries. His extraordinary domain amounted to more than 700 millions. He has said that he distributed upwards of 500 millions in endowments to the army and what is very extraordinary he who circulated such heaps of wealth never possessed any private property of his own he had collected in the museum of treasures which it was impossible to estimate and yet he, he never had a picture or a curiosity of his own on his return from Italy and on the eve of his departure for Egypt, he became possessed of Malmaison, and there he deposited nearly all his property. He purchased it in the name of his wife, who was older than himself, and consequently, in case of his surviving her, he must have forfeited all claim to it. The fact is, as he himself has said, that he never had a taste or a desire for riches. If I now possess anything, continued he, it is owing to measures which have been adopted since my departure. But even in that case, it depended on a hair's breadth chance whether there should be anything in the world I might call my own or not. But everyone has his relative ideas. I have a taste for founding and not for possessing. My riches consisted in glory and celebrity. The Simplon and the Louvre were in the eyes of the people and of foreigners, more my property than private domains could have been. I purchased diamonds for the crown, I repaired and adorned the imperial palaces, and I could not help thinking sometimes that the expenses lavished by Josephine on her greenhouses and her gallery were a real injury to my Jardin des Plantes and my Musée de Paris. On taking the command of the army of Italy, Napoleon, notwithstanding his extreme youth, immediately impressed the troops with a spirit of subordination, confidence, and the most absolute devotedness. The army was subdued by his genius rather than seduced by his popularity. He was in general very severe and reserved during the whole course of his life. He has uniformly disdained 
to court the favor of the multitude. By unworthy means, perhaps he has even carried this feeling to an extent which may have been injurious to him. A singular custom was established in the army of Italy in consequence of his youth of the commander or from some other cause. After each battle, the eldest soldiers used to hold a council and confer a new rank on their young general, who... When he made his appearance in the camp, was received by the veterans and saluted with his new title. They made him a corporal at Lodi and a sergeant at Castiglione, and hence the surname of Petit Corporal, which was for a long time applied to Napoleon by the soldiers. How subtle is the chain which unites the most trivial circumstances to the most important events! Perhaps this very nickname contributed to his miraculous success on the return in 1815, while he was haranguing the first battalion he met, which he found it necessary to parlay with, a voice from the ranks exclaimed, Vivre notre petit corporal! We will never fight against him! The administration of the Directory and that of the General-in-Chief of the Army of Italy seemed to distinct governments, the Directory in France, but the emigrants to death. The army of Italy never inflicted capital punishment on any one of them. The directory on learning that Wurmser was besieged in Mantua went so far as to write to Napoleon to remind him that he was an emigrant. But Napoleon, on making him prisoner, eagerly sought to render an affecting homage and respect to his old age. The directory adopted the most insulting forms of communicating with the Pope. The general of the army of Italy addressed him by the words, Most Holy Father, and wrote to him with respect to directory endeavored to overthrow the authority of the Pope. Napoleon preserved it. The directory banished and prescribed priests. Napoleon commanded his soldiers, wherever they might fall in with him, to remember that they were Frenchmen and their brothers. The directory would have exterminated every vestige of aristocracy. Napoleon wrote to the democracy of Genoa, blaming their violence, and did not hesitate to declare that if the Genoese attached any value to the preservation of his esteem, they must learn to respect the statue of Doria and the institutions to which they were indebted for their glory. The 7th to the 9th, we continued our course and nothing occurred to interrupt the uniformity which surrounded us. Our days were all alike. The correctness of my journal alone informed me of the day of the week or of the month. Fortunately, my time was employed and therefore the day usually slipped on with a certain degree of facility. The materials which I collected in the afternoon conversation employed me so as to leave no idle time until the next day. Meanwhile, the emperor observed that I was very much occupied and he even suspected the subject on which I was engaged. He determined to ascertain the fact and obtain sight of a few pages of my journal. He was not displeased with it. Having alluded several times to the subject, he observed that such a work would be interesting rather than useful. The military events, for example, thus detailed in the ordinary course of conversations, would be meager, incomplete, and devoid of end or object. They would be mere anecdotes frequently of the most puerile kind instead of grand operations and results i eagerly seized the favorable opportunity i entirely concurred in his opinion and ventured to suggest the idea of his dictating to me the campaigns of italy it would i observed be a benefit to the country a true monument of national glory our time is unemployed our hours are tedious occupation will help divert us and some moments may not be devoid of pleasure this idea became the subject of various conversations. At length, the emperor came to a determination, and on Saturday, the 9th of September, he called me into his cab and dictated to me for the first time some details respecting the siege of Toulon. They will be found in the campaigns of Italy, which will form a separate work without at all interfering with the anecdotes, which I shall continue to note down here whenever an opportunity occurs. The 10th to the 13th. On approaching the line, we meet with what are called the trade winds. That is to say, winds blowing constantly from the east. Science explains this phenomenon in a way sufficiently satisfactory when a vessel is sailing from Europe first encounters these winds. They blow from the northeast in proportion as the ship 
approaches the line, the winds become more easterly. Calms are generally to be apprehended under the line. When the line is crossed, the winds gradually change to the south until they blow in the direction of the southeast. At length, after passing the tropics, the trade winds are lost and variable winds are met with, as in our European regions. A ship sailing from Europe to St. Helena is always driven in a westerly direction by these constant easterly winds. It would be very difficult to gain that island by a direct course and indeed this is never attempted the ship stands away to the variable winds in the southern latitude and then shapes her course towards the cape of good hope so as to fall in with the trade winds from the southeast which bring her with the wind astern to saint helena two different courses are taken to gain the variable winds of the southern latitudes the one is to cross the line about the 20th or 24th degree of longitude reckoning from the meridian of london those who prefer this course affirm that it is less exposed to the equatorial calms and that though it frequently has a disadvantage of carrying the vessel within sight of Brazil, yet it enables her to make that part of her voyage in a short time. Admiral Cockburn, who was inclined to regard this course as a prejudice and a routine, determined in favor of the second method, which consisted in steering more to the east and following particular examples with which he was acquainted he endeavored to cross the line about the second or third degree of longitude he doubted not that standing towards the variable winds he should pass sufficiently near St. Helena to shorten his passage considerably even if he should not succeed in reaching the island by tacking without leaving the trade winds the winds, to our great astonishment, veered to the west, a circumstance which the admiral informed us was more common than we supposed, and this tended to favor his opinion. He abandoned the bad sailors of his squadron in proportion as they lagged behind, and he determined on gaining the place of his destination with all possible speed. The 14th to the 18th, after a few slight gales and several calms, we had on the 16th a considerable fall of rain, to the great joy of the crew, the heat was very moderate. It may indeed be said that with the exception of the storm at Madeira, we had uniformly enjoyed mild weather, but water was very scarce on board the ship, and for the sake of economy, the crew took advantage of the opportunity of collecting the rainwater of which each sailor laid by a little store for his own use the rain fell heavily just as the emperor had got upon the deck to take his afternoon walk but this did not disappoint him of his usual exercise he merely called for his famous great coat which the english regarded with deep interest the grand marshal and i attended the emperor in his walk the rain descended heavily for upwards of an hour when the emperor left the deck i had great difficulty in stripping off my wet clothes Almost everything I wore was soaked through. For several succeeding days, the weather continued very rain rainy. This somewhat impeded my labors, for the damp penetrated into our wretched little cabin. And on the other hand, it was not very agreeable to walk on deck. This was the first time during our passage that we had had anything like a continuance of wet weather and it quite disconcerted us. I filled up the intervals between my hours of occupation in conversing with the officers of the ship. I was not on intimate terms with any of them, but I kept up a daily intercourse of civility and politeness to them all. They loved to talk with us in French affairs and their ignorance of all the concerned France and the French people was almost incredible. We excited mutual astonishment in each other. They surprised us by their degenerate political principles and we astonished them by our new ideas and manners of which they had previously formed no conception. They certainly knew infinitely less of France and of China. One of the principal officers of the ship in a familiar conversation happened to say, I suppose you would be very much alarmed if we were to land you on the coast of France. Why so, I inquired, because, replied he, the king would perhaps make you pay dearly for having left your country to follow another sovereign, and also because you wear a cockade, which he has prohibited. And is this language becoming an Englishman, observed I? You must be degenerated indeed. You are, it is true, far removed from the period of your revolution to which you so justly apply the epithet 
glorious, but we who are nearer to ours, by which we have gained so much, may tell you that every word you say is heresy. In the first place, our punishment depends not on the king's pleasure. We are subject only to the law. Now there exists no law against us, and if any law were to be violated for the purpose of applying to our cause... It would be your duty to protect us. Your general has pledged himself to do so by the capitulation of Paris, and it would be an eternal disgrace to the English ministry were they to permit the sacrifice of lives, which their public faith has solemnly guaranteed. In the next place, we are not following another sovereign. That the Emperor Napoleon was our sovereign is an undeniable fact. But he has abdicated, and his reign is at an end. You are confounding private actions with party measures, love and devotedness with political opinions. Finally, with regard to our colors, which seem to have dazzled you so much, they are but a remnant of our old costume. We wear them today only because we wore them yesterday. One cannot with indifference lay aside things to which one is attached. That can only be done from constraint. Or necessity, why did you not deprive of us of our colors when you deprived us of our arms? The one act would have been as reasonable as the other. We are here only as private men. We do not preach sedition. We cannot deny that these colors are dear to us. We are attached to them because they have seen us victorious over all our enemies, because we have paraded them in triumph through every capital of Europe, and because we wore them while we were the first nation in the world. On another occasion, one of the officers, after glancing at the extraordinary vicissitudes of recent events, said, Who knows whether we may not yet be destined to repair the misfortunes which we have occasioned to you. What would be your astonishment if Wellington would one day conduct Napoleon back to Paris? I should be astonished indeed, I replied, but I should certainly decline the honor of being one of the party at such a price. I would not hesitate to abandon Napoleon himself, but I may rest easy on that score, for I can swear Napoleon will never put me to such a trial. It is from him I imbibe these sentiments. It was he who cured me of the contrary doctrine, which I call the error of my youth. The English were also very fond of asking us questions concerning the emperor whose character and disposition, as they afterwards avowed, had been represented to them in the falsest colors. It was not their fault, they observed, if they formed an erroneous estimate of his character. They knew him only through the works published in England, which were all greatly exaggerated and much to his prejudice. They had several of these publications on board the ship. One day I happened to cast my eyes on one of the most malignant character. On another occasion, when I was about to look at a book which one of the officers was reading, he suddenly closed it, observing it was so violent against the emperor. He could not prevail on himself to let me see it. Another time, the admiral questioned me respecting certain imputations contained in the different works in his library, some of which he said enjoy a degree of credit, while all had produced a great sensation in England. This circumstance suggested to me the idea of success excessively examining all the works of this kind that were on board the ship in order to note down my opinion of them in my journal conceiving that so favorable an opportunity might never again occur of obtaining if I chose information on those points which it might be worthwhile to inquire into before I commence my review of these works I must beg to offer a few general remarks they will suffice to answer by anticipation many of the numberless accusations that will fall in my way Cal Calumny and falsehood are the arms of the civil or political, the foreign or domestic enemy. They are the resource of the vanquished and the feeble, of those who are governed by hatred or fear. They are the food of the drawing room and the garbage of the public space. They rage with the greater fury in proportion as their object is exalted. There is nothing which they will not venture to promulgate. The more absurd, ridiculous, and incredible calumnies and falsehoods may be, the more eagerly are they received and repeated from mouth to mouth. Triumph and success are but fresh causes of irritation. A moral storm will invariably gather, and bursting in the moment of adversity, it will precipitate and complete the fall, and will become the immense lever of public opinion. No man was ever so much assailed and abused as Napoleon. No individual was ever the subject of so many pamphlets, libels, atrocious and absurd stories and false accusations. 
nor could it be otherwise. Napoleon risen from the common man, from the rank of life to supreme distinction, advancing at the head of a revolution, which he himself had civilized, plunged by these two circumstances into a deadly contest with the rest of Europe, a contest in which he was subdued only because he wished to terminate it too speedily. Napoleon united in himself the genius, the force, and the destiny of his own power, the conqueror of his neighbors, and in some measure a universal monarch, a Marius in the eyes of the aristocrats of Europe, a Scylla for the demagogues, a Caesar for the republicans, could not but raise against himself a hurricane of passions, both at home and abroad, despair policy and fury in every country painted him as an object of detestation and alarm. Thus, all that has been said against him can excite no astonishment. It is only surprising that more calumny has not been uttered and that it has not produced a much greater effect. When in the enjoyment of his power, he never would permit anyone to reply to the attacks that were made upon him. The pains bestowed on such answers said he would only have given additional weight to the accusations they were intended to refute. It would have been said that all was written in my defense was ordered to pay for the ill-managed praise of those by whom I was surrounded had already in some instances been more prejudicial to me than all the abuse of which I was the object. Facts were the most convincing answers. A fine mon monument, another good law, or a new triumph were sufficient to defeat thousands of such falsehoods. Declamation passes away, but deeds remain.